Hello. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? I'm coming through now. It's wonderful to be here with you all in this very, uh, well, what, what should we say? Dark, kind of cloudy, a bit miserable, you know? It's, I think today is the last day of summer, isn't it, technically? They were saying, on the, yeah, it, well, um, it doesn't feel like the last day of summer, but hey, we are firmly into autumn now. It's absolutely fantastic, but it's okay. It's fine. We're gathered here together. It's going to be wonderful. We'll feel warm in a minute when we start jumping up and dancing and everything. It will be great. My name is Ben. I'm the curate here at All Saints, and I'm going to be leading today's service, and Andrew Killick is going to be coming and preaching with us at some point. I think he's still getting coffee at the back there, but he will arrive. Andrew Killick. I've already heard the sermon once today, and it is fantastic. So you're in for a treat. He's done a really good job. So yeah, be prepared for what he has to share for us. And you may have already noticed that we all have these wonderful little name badges on our chest. That's because today is Name Badge Sunday. It's everybody's favorite Sunday in the year. Everyone looks forward to Name Badge Sunday is coming up. It's this week. It's fantastic. It's here. It's wonderful. It's going to be a great joy. So if you don't know anyone, it's fine. Go up to them today and say, hi, I now know your name, and let's have a little conversation. So today is the best chance of the year to talk to someone that you haven't spoken to before. Okay, so today, Andrew is going to be speaking about God above all. And as I was preparing for this, uh, this uh, what, leading this week's service, I started reading Revelation, and Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says this, here I am, I stand at the door and knock, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And what I absolutely love is that we're thinking about this almighty, this all-powerful God who is above everything today. And yet that almighty and all-powerful God, that being that is beyond our comprehension, wants to have a relationship with you. Jesus is standing at the door of our hearts, and he's knocking, and he's waiting to be entered, to be let in. So as we start our service, as we prepare to worship a God who knows us and loves us, let's make a point of welcoming him into every part of our lives this morning, into every situation Maybe you're having a bit of a difficult time at work, or maybe there's a problem that you just can't get out of your head. You can't stop thinking about it. Let's make a point of welcoming God into that situation this morning, of trusting in his power, of trusting that he is above it. He is above all. Let's give it over to God, and let's worship him this morning. So please stand if you are able as we prepare to worship our God, and I'll say a prayer over us. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are above it all. Thank you, Lord God, that we can trust in you and have faith in you. That there is no, that there is no darkness that your light cannot overcome. So whatever we are facing this week, whatever we are thinking about, Lord God, I pray may you show us that you are above it all this week. May we know you powerfully with us. And may you help us, Lord, to worship you as the King of Kings, as the Lord of Lords this morning. Let's make sure, Lord, that you are the one that leads us, and that you are the one that leads, it, uh, that leads this church. Lord God, we lift ourselves up to you this morning. Let's worship our God and King. Sing, we bow our hearts. We bow our hearts. We lift our hands. We turn our Surrender to the truth that all we need is found in you. Receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration, how wonderful. Christ. 
receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God, receive our adoration, how wonderful you are, receive, receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration, how wonderful you are. We sing every soul, every soul you've saved sings out, everything you've made resounds, all creation standing now, lifting up your name. Up in the angel song, we're gathered to your ancient throne. Children in our Father's arms, shouting out your praise. Receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration how wonderful you are receive our adoration receive our adoration Jesus Lamb of God receive our adoration how wonderful you are how wonderful you are. We sing, I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord forever. Sing it again, I will bless the Lord forever. I will bless the Lord forever. I will trust Him at all times. He has delivered me from all. Set my feet upon a rock, and I will not, and I will not be moved, and I'll say of the Lord, you are my shield, my strength, my portion, deliverer, my shelter. Strong tower, my very present help in times of need. Whom have I? Whom have I in heaven but you? There's none. I desire besides you, and you have made me glad, and I'll say of the Lord, you are my shield, my strength, my portion, deliverer, my shelter, strong tower. My very present help, you are my shield, my strength, my portion. 
ocean, deliverer of my shelter, strong tower, my very present help in times of need. You have made me glad. And you have made me glad. And I'll say of the Lord, you are my shield, my strength, my portion, deliverer, my shelter, strong tower, my very present help you are my shield my strength my portion deliverer my shelter strong tower my very present help in times of need Thank you, Jesus, so much for the strength that you've given us and the strength you've given me this morning. Thank you for this church and the people we can be with and raise up your name and worship you this morning, Lord God. Thank you. a song I know it well a melody that's never failed on mountains high in valleys low my soul will rest my confidence in you a name his name is Jesus my Savior's cross has set the sinner free hope has a name his name is Jesus oh Christ be praised I have been Salvation's flame, Christ undefeated, trampled the grave. See now the cross be lifted high. The light has come, the light has won. Behold the Christ. The light has come, the light has come. As one behold the Christ, the light has come. The light has come. The light has one behold the Christ. Home has a name. His name is Jesus. My Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Home has a name. His name is Jesus. Oh, Christ be praised. I have victory. There'll be a day, my hope complete. Now home in glory, your face I'll see. My pain no more, my 
fear will cease. I bow my life, I fix my eyes on Christ, my King. I bow my life, I bow my life, I fix my eyes on Christ, my King. I bow my life, I fix my eyes on Christ, my King. Hope has a name. As a name, his name is Jesus, my Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has a name, his name is Jesus. Oh, Christ be praised, I have victory. a name his name is Jesus my Savior's cross has set this sinner free hope has a name his name is Jesus oh Christ be praised I have victory Oh, Christ be praised, I have victory. Oh, Christ be praised, I have victory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, so much. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. Thank you for bringing us here this morning. And Heavenly Father, we just want to lift you, lift you to your rightful place this morning. We're going to sing, crown him with many crowns and honor God with what he deserves, which is all of us and everything. Sways 
From pole to pole that wars may cease and all be prayer and praise. His reign shall know no end. And round his pierced feet, fair flowers of paradise extend their fragrance ever sweet. have a seat okay it's almost that time in our service where our kids go out to their wonderful groups but as it is name by Sunday and this normally takes a minute or two to get everyone to where they need to be whilst everybody is moving to their wonderful places my challenge to you today is to talk to someone that you don't know okay so for example if I didn't know my own son right now I'd say hi Lucas how are you doing you having a good time and he's having a wonderful time. There we go. How wonderful is that? I'll hand him back to you. <laughs> there you go. It's a good thing he's cute. Okay, so is, does everyone know what they're doing? So you're going to chat to someone, be it your neighbor or someone that you've not chatted to before. That would be great, great whilst the kids are going out. So I'm going to say a quick prayer for them. And then we will start talking. Okay, wonderful. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gifts of our children. Thank you for the joy that they are. And so if you did want to move forward, it'll make me and Andrew feel a bit better as well. Completely up to you as well, but you are more than welcome. The fun, you hear better with the fun. You see things. It's great. Okay. Now, now that all the kids are gone, I have an important announcement. This is slightly different. We don't normally have notices uh, this early on, but Tim asked me to remind you all, okay, because this would be a wonderful thing for us all to do. You might all know that it is Catherine's last week next week, the 29th. That is her last week with us, and it's really sad. She's been here for 40, well, she's been working here for 14 years. She's done an amazing job, and Tim and a few other people from youth are wanting to put together that. Lead us in our readings, and then Andrew is going to share his thoughts with us. Right, today being a day for names, we are highlighting Luke and Paul. So I will start from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verse 26, and I'll be reading all the way through to verse 39. Jesus and his disciples sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, 
shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. Now we turn to Romans chapter 8, and I will read from verse 18 through to verse 28. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Shall we pray for a moment before we begin? Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. 
over the last few weeks, we've had several talks about God, the God who reveals himself. God restores, God notices, and now today, God above all. Now, the God who reveals himself, this is something unique about Christianity. It's the story of God revealing himself to us. Most religions are mankind reaching up to God, but Christianity is God reaching down to us. And then God restores two weeks ago. God doesn't abandon us if we are weak or sinful, we go astray. Remember that lovely verse from Psalm 23, he restores my soul, as you'd expect of the Lord, the good shepherd. And then last week, God notices, he notices everything that's going on in our lives. He knows exactly what sort of week we've had, a week of rejoicing, a week of misery, pain, whatever may have been happening to us during this last week. He knows, he notices, he loves, and he's not idle. And now this week, God above all, the sovereign Lord. And he's sovereign in at least four different spheres, which we shall look at one by one. He's sovereign over evil spirits, over creation, over our future, and over our present. First of all, that passage from Luke chapter 8, illustrating that Jesus is Lord over the demons. Now, they had crossed over to the other side of Galilee, the eastern side, it's Gentile territory, where they herd pigs, and of course Jews would never do that. So we're far away from the Jewish part of the world, and perhaps Jesus was wanting to have a training session with his, his disciples, who knows, but that was not to be, or it was training of a rather different sort, because a man who was totally out of control came up to them. He was behaving very oddly. He didn't have clothes, he didn't have a home, he was shouting, he was feeling tormented by the presence of Jesus, because, of course, demons can recognize, do recognize Jesus. And he was very strong, he couldn't be bound. And he called himself, I think rather petulantly, Legion, that's my name, Legion, because there were so many devils inside him. You're probably familiar that a legion was a very large group of the Roman army, 5,000 foot soldiers. So obviously he felt that he was really possessed by lots and lots of evil spirits. And yet, God is greater. Jesus has authority over these demons, these evil spirits. And with a word of command, he bids them leave. And they do. And they go into the pigs, and the pigs rush down the hill and are drowned in the lake. But of course, that raises a few issues, doesn't it? Some people in our cynical, materialist West are saying, do demons really exist? Some people are very cynical about that. In fact, there was a... Uh, a clergyman who uh, was at a conference and uh, saying, well, I think it's time we dispensed with all this mumbo-jumbo about evil spirits and devils and demons and so on, isn't it? And another clergyman was also there, John Woolmer, the editor, the writer, rather, of the book that you see on the screen, The Devil Goes Missing, question mark. He was so surprised by this attitude from a Church of England clergyman that he wrote a letter to the Times wanting to uh, remind people that the devil is real and evil spirits do exist. He wrote very sanely and wisely, Sir, I write as an Anglican clergyman with a degree in mathematics who has had some 40 years ministry. In this time, it has been my privilege to visit many houses where parishioners and others were deeply disturbed by inexplicable, frightening phenomena. I have also prayed with a number of people who, usually through dabbling in some sort of occult practices, were troubled by some spiritual presence. I have exercised this ministry in sophisticated Oxford, rural Somerset, working-class Leicester, and many parts of East Africa, 
Papua New Guinea and Argentina. In every situation, the phenomena have been similar and are most easily explained by taking the opening chapters of Mark's Gospel seriously. Mark's Gospel starts, by the way, with lots of confrontations with demons as well as healings of people who were ill. Twice, John continues, powerful physical forces have left a person or a building, in each case knocking backwards my helper. Once in rural Zambia, my wife and I were addressed in perfect Oxbridge English by a spirit saying, go away, I am not leaving this person. <laughs> no English person had visited that village for many years and no one spoke English except the priest. Now, obviously, there are uh, huge dangers of exaggerating the need for this ministry. Over-enthusiastic exorcists can do more harm than good. Actual possession by evil spirits is very rare, but being troubled by negative spiritual powers, in my experience, is quite common. And people are enormously grateful when their troubles are taken seriously and when the spiritual forces disappear. So there is a very sane reminder that demons do exist and they needed the authority of Jesus to be cast out. But secondly, why did Jesus allow all those pigs to be killed? And our commentators rather skate over this. Uh, perhaps the person who's been healed is worth more than many pigs? A good suggestion. Perhaps it is to prove to him and to others the reality of the demons and the reality of his healing. Yes. Or perhaps... God blessed those herdsmen very specially in the next few years with maybe help from neighbours and increased fertility of the pigs. I've never seen that suggestion in a commentary, but I think it might well be right that they weren't just abandoned. Oh, well, you've lost your livelihood now. That's just tough. I don't think God behaves that way. He loves all, and perhaps he gave special help to them over the next few years. But third problem, uh, why were the locals afraid? Was it because they were afraid that there would be more destruction to their livelihood? Or were they just afraid of Jesus and his power? You can sometimes see this, can't you? A really godly person attracts some people and repels others. There's a sort of fear of holiness, a fear of their godliness. And if that is so with people now, how much more must it have been so with Jesus? He attracted many, and he repelled many. If that's the correct explanation, then it's rather nice that Jesus himself doesn't go to the village and say, come on, you people, behave. Just, just think more clearly. I'm doing good, not evil. Don't be afraid. He doesn't do that. What he does is to send someone they know, legion, now cured, to tell them about the wonderful works of God. So Jesus is Lord over evil spirits. Let's move on to that second area. He's Lord over creation. And I discovered something rather interesting about Romans chapter 8 this week. I was reading Tom Wright's book, Tom Wright, former bishop of Durham, and... Uh, you know Romans 8, it starts out by saying, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Wonderful truth about our salvation. And it ends by saying, nothing can separate us from the love of God. A wonderful truth about our life now and into eternity. But in the middle, there's a section about creation, which is rather surprising, really. You'd think that the most important thing to consider is us and our salvation, but no, it talks about creation. Uh, and it says this, verse 19 of chapter 8, the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. And there on the screen are some illustrations of that groaning. 
climate change, fires, droughts, floods, wars, new viruses, all sorts of things. Creation is in a mess, but it has hope. It's almost as though creation is personified here. It longs for the children of God to be revealed. It will be set free from its bondage to decay and die. Now, there seems to be, therefore, a mysterious link between our destiny and the destiny of the created world. Once we were stewards of that created world. You remember in the book of Genesis, it talks about us being put in the Garden of Eden to look after the world, to tend it, to be stewards of that world. And then came the fall. And not only was mankind affected, but creation was affected as well. And one day, we and it will be rescued, redeemed. And Tom Wright sums up this remarkable passage by saying, then at last creation will see its true rulers and will know that the time has come for it to be rescued from corruption. So Jesus is Lord over creation. Third area, Jesus is Lord over our future destiny. Are you worried that the world is in a mess? Are you worried that your life is in a mess? It may be work problems, health problems, relationships, finances, church commitment, all sorts of ways in which we get in a mess. And this passage says that our sufferings in this present world are temporary. It's a bit like living in darkness here, and yet we are moving towards a wonderful moment when we shall come out into the light. When Jesus comes again, it will be like the lightning shining from the east to the west, daylight dawning, and that will be the moment when all the mess of our lives and the life of the creation is cleared up. So we're groaning, we're in pain, we, can't, we wait, we can't see. We do have the Holy Spirit living in us as the first roots, the guarantee, the promise of better things to come. And one day, God's children, those who belong to Jesus, will be in the presence of his glory. They will be adopted, rescued, gloriously free. What an amazing prospect. Jesus is Lord over our future destiny. And fourth section, Jesus is Lord over our present as well as our future, our present circumstances. There are two ways in which the Romans passage talks about this. First of all, in prayer, where he says in verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. What an amazing uh, truth this is, that the Spirit helps us when we just don't know what to pray. Have you ever knelt down or, or sat uh, praying? Whatever posture you adopt, it doesn't really matter. But what matters is our humble approach to God. We come to him and we say, Father... And then we're lost for words. I don't know what to say. And the Spirit helps us at those moments, praying within us, even when we are lost for words and groaning inwardly. And the second way in which Jesus is Lord over our present circumstance is that everything works out for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Well, this verse 28 can be translated in various different ways, as it happens. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God works for good, or everything works for good to those who love God. It, it can be either, but it means, roughly speaking, the same thing. God works for good. And you might wonder why we're now looking at a picture of a wheelchair. One of the most striking 
illustrations I ever heard in this church was from John Lambert a few years ago, our previous vicar. Uh, he made a comment about the American evangelist Johnny Erickson. You may have heard of her. She had a diving accident aged 17 and became a tetraplegic or uh, triplegic, whatever the word is. I can't quite remember the exact words. Anyway, she was paralyzed from the shoulders downwards and uh, was in a wheelchair and was angry, was bitter, was feeling that suicide was the only way out. But she gradually came to accept what had happened to her. Her faith was restored and she is now an amazing evangelist and writer, one who loves God. And John Lambert said uh, that when that moment comes that she meets the Lord face to face, she will hand back her wheelchair and say, thank you, Lord, I really needed that. Because it helped her, helped her to come to a deeper faith in him, helped her to communicate with others. Can we face our own perhaps rather more minor problems with the same trust and confidence in God. Now, there are actually terms and conditions in this verse, you may have noticed. This promise is for those who love him and whom he has called. And that, of course, raises questions. How do I know God has called me? I'm not good enough. I've committed unforgivable sins. I'm full of doubt. And anyway, the whole thing is subject to predestination, isn't it? What happens if I'm not predestined to meet with Jesus and be in his heavenly kingdom on that great day? Well, let's look at some answers to those three big problems there. Sin, doubt, and predestination. First of all, sin. There's a wonderful verse in 1 John, chapter 1. This is the first letter of John, right towards the back of the Bible. Maybe the very, very last book of the Bible that was written. We don't quite know, but it might be. And 1 John 1, 9 says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he will forgive. And that applies to lying, stealing, ignoring or despising or even attacking God and his people, cheating, even murdering. Nothing is unforgivable except constantly and forever turning our backs on God. That's the only thing that cannot be forgiven because God won't break into our lives against our will. But he longs to come in. He longs that we should turn to him and confess our sins. So, if we confess, he will forgive. Not he may forgive, he will forgive. But I'm full of doubt, say some. Ah, faith needs feeding. How do we feed faith? By reading the Bible by meeting with fellow Christians, by sharing our doubts, talking about difficulties, and working towards solutions. I think that doubt and lack of Bible reading probably go quite closely together. So, feed our faith. And finally, what about predestination, that hoary old chestnut? Uh, do we choose God, or does he choose us? Which is it? It can't be both, can it? Well, yes, it can. Both are true. We chose to follow God, and he chose us from eternity. Both are true. How can that be? It's a sort of contradiction, isn't it? Well, we don't know everything about God and about our lives. There are lots of what you might call secrets that God keeps. I love Deuteronomy 29, 29. It's a lovely, easy verse to re remember the reference. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forevermore. Yes, there are one or two things that we don't understand. How can God be three and yet one? We don't understand. How can we choose God with free will and yet he has predestined us? 
to be his followers. It doesn't make sense to us. It does to him. Or again, there's Isaiah, chapter 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your thoughts my thoughts, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. He knows, even if we don't. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, the uh, old version of this says, now we see through a glass darkly. If you feel like that sometimes, I can't see my way through life. We see through a glass darkly. And Romans 8, 25 says, we hope for what we do not see. Hope in the Bible means confident expectation. And we confidently expect something we can't see. He hasn't revealed everything to us. He's said a lot about the future. For example, Jesus says those wonderful words in John 14 about going ahead to prepare a place for us. And he, Jesus, is the way, the truth, and the life. There's a lot that's not said there, but enough is said to make it quite certain that we are on the right track. So, we don't know everything, and it's not surprising that we don't understand the problem of predestination and free will, but both are true. So we're almost at the end, and it's time to wake up your neighbour if he's gone to sleep, because this is the punchline. God above all was the title, but I want to add a few words to that. We need to seek God above all. We need to make him the most important priority in our lives. If we've never come to him for the first time in repentance and faith, then we need to do so. He is sovereign, but is he yet sovereign of our lives? Now, this is the most important decision we'll ever make. A decision about career is not so important. It is important. A decision about marriage or not getting married is important, but it's not so important. A decision about which croquet club to join is important, very important, but not as important as... What do I do about Jesus? Do I accept his offer of forgiveness? Or do I turn my back on him? Now, if we have had any involvement with the occult, we need to say sorry to the Lord. We need to repent and turn away from that and turn to him for rescue. There is no other way of being delivered from any sort of residue of evil influence in our lives. The occult, any contact with the occult is immensely dangerous and far-reaching. And if we've never thought about Jesus, inviting Jesus into our lives, perhaps now is the moment. Seek God above all. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. I think we all found that very helpful. I wonder, what is God saying to you? About what we have just heard? What is the thing that God wants you to continue thinking about as you go throughout the rest of the week? Why don't we just take a minute now to reflect on what we've just heard and to ask God, reveal to us, Lord, what you really want us to take away. Heavenly Father, thank you that you speak to us. Thank you that there is more of you to know and to learn. Help us, Lord God, to feed on you in faith. 
place our trust in you and we ask, Lord, continue to speak to us. Amen. Elaine is now going to come and lead us in a time of prayer. Thanks, Andrew. Um, That sets it up very well for this um, time of prayer, to remember that actually, isn't it great that our God is in control and we have access to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. And when I was thinking just a little bit about this prayer, I'm reminded of this scripture in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And it's that bit where it says, you are a royal priest, we are a royal priesthood. And it's that sense, we've heard how great our God is. That is our God. But we are priests. And a priest is called to represent the people to God and to represent God to the people. We are the intermediary between the people and God. And so we're going to use that a little bit to just focus our prayers. You come as priests. And then I was thinking of that scripture where it says in, um, in Acts, and the Holy Spirit falls, and the disciples are called to be witnesses, and they're sent to um, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the other ends of the earth. So this morning, as we come for priests, we're going to use that as our little focal point. And Jerusalem represents the people around us, our home, our neighborhood, our work, Judea is our city, our town, the Tees Valley. Sorry, yeah. Samaria is our nation. It's bigger. It's always going forward and then to the other ends of the earth. So we're going to focus like that just to give a little bit of structure. And at the end of that, I'm going to just pray a brief prayer. And then you put in something that's on your heart as a priest. What's on your heart for your home? for your school, for your colleagues? What's on your heart for the Tees Valley? Yeah? And at the end of each section, we'll use that phrase that um, Rob brought last week about, Father, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So I just pray. Yeah, Father God, we thank you that you are God. Thank you that we don't know everything. And we don't understand everything, but we can trust you, that you do know everything, and you are sovereign, and you are holy. And thank you that we can come boldly to you now as a priest, and we bring the darkness that's around us, Lord. And we bring the pain that's around us, and we say, Father God, will you move? Will you have your way? And Father God, we pray for those within our families that yet don't know you. We pray for those that are sick. We pray for the difficult situations that we have in our home. We pray for those in um, our workplaces that, Lord God, where there is darkness, let us show your goodness. Let us bring the light of you. Will you move? Perhaps there's something you now just want to lift up to God. Where do you want the witness of Jesus Christ to be? Father, in your mercy... Hear our prayers. And Father God, we bring to you our locality 
around us. We bring to you the um, Tees Valley. And Father, we pray in Jesus' name that there will be an expansion of your gospel. There will be a witness for you right across this Tees Valley, Lord. We want to pray for revival. We want to pray, Lord, that you'll bring your light into many communities and neighborhoods. We thank you that this morning, right across this Tees Valley, there is worshiping communities, worshiping you, lifting your name high. Thank you that there are many expressions of faith, food banks, mother and toddler groups, whatever it is, Lord, that the church, your people are involved in. And we pray a blessing on them. Thank you, Father, that there's 50 alphas across the Tees Valley starting this September and that your gospel is going out. And we invite you, Father God, to rest your presence on all those that are leading these alphas and all those that are coming to ask questions. Will you answer them? And perhaps there's something that you know that's happening across the Tees Valley that you're involved in, or others are, that you want to lift to God. Where do you desire to see God work? Is there a particular group of people? It might be in youth. What's God laid on your heart? Father God, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. And Father God, we pray for our nation. And that's sometimes one of those times where we come and we say, we don't know how to pray or what to say. But we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you intercede with us and you pray with us. And we pray for our nation. We pray that, Father God, you will pour your spirit down on us as a nation like we've never known before. We pray for our government. And we pray a blessing on them, Lord. And we pray that you will speak to them and you will uh, reveal yourself to them. And, Father, we pray, too, for all those Christians within government all those people who are in influential places, Lord, that seek to bring your goodness and your light into the darkness. Father God, will you fill them with power, with strength, with wisdom. Make their voice strong. And Father God, we pray that their voice will be heard and they will make a difference. What would you want to pray for our nation? Lift our nation to him. Father God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we do pray for the nations, Lord. And we want to pray for those that are sent out from here to bring the gospel to the nations. We pray for many that are seeking to serve you. We pray for the persecuted church, Lord. And we pray, and we pray, and we pray. Come, Lord, give them everything that they need today. Sustain them, give them courage and give them wisdom. Perhaps there's a nation on your heart you want to pray for. Perhaps there's a missionary you want to lift up to God.
Father God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, we thank you that we stand in hope and we have been chosen and we have chosen you. And thank you that we experience your goodness. And Lord, I pray that each one of us this week will know what it is to take your goodness and your light into wherever we go. And thank you that your plans and your purposes never stop and that you're always moving forward. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Ellen. Can I invite the worship band back up, please? Thank you. As we come towards the end of our service, as we prepare ourselves to leave this church and to go out into the week, let's take that God who is above all with us. Let's make sure that as we are worshiping here, we are inviting him into every part of our lives, that we are trusting that he is a God who is above all, that there is no darkness that his light cannot overcome. So whatever you are facing this week, whatever might be causing you a little bit of worry or anxiousness, let's lift up to God now. Let's worship him. Let's praise him. Please stand. Thanks, Ben. Um, So I really wanted to pick up on what... um, This one. (laughs) You good? (laughs) No, I was just saying, um, um, Andrew, you said about um, adding those words to above all. Was it... um, Can you remind me, was it... We seek you, or we should seek the God above all. I can, sorry, I can't remember the exact, something like that. Seek God above all. So we want to sing um, Psalm 63, um, Better Than Life, where we're just talking about seeking God um, and finding him. Oh God, you're my God, I seek you. Oh, my soul, it longs for you. My flesh faints for you in this land, this dry land where there is no drink. I've looked upon you in this place, beholding your power and glory, Sing it again, oh God, you're my God. Oh God, you're my God, I seek you. Oh my soul, it longs for you. My flesh faints for you in this land, this dry land where there is no drink. looked upon you in this place, beholding your power and glory, Lord, because your love is better than life is. I will praise you as long as I'm alive and in the face of precious Jesus oh my soul will be satisfied oh God God, I seek you, oh my soul, it longs for you, my flesh faints for you in this land, this dry land where there is no drink, I've looked upon you in this land. Your power and glory, Lord, because your love is better than life is, 
I will praise you as long as I'm alive. And in the face of precious Jesus, oh, my soul will be satisfied. Satisfied. goes to the bridge you have been my help you have been my help in the shadow of your wings I'll sing for joy oh you have been my help in the shadow of your wings I'll sing Because your love is better than life is, I will praise you as long as I'm alive. And in the face of precious Jesus, oh, my soul will be satisfied. your love is better than life is I will praise you as long as I'm alive and in the face of precious Jesus oh my soul will be satisfied Thing about Christ being our firm foundation, our rock, um, and where we build our lives. Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't I've still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense so I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus And he's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would he fail now? He won't, he won't fail, he won't fail. I sing Christ my firm foundation, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down 
He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't Rain came, rain came, and wind blew, but my house was built on you, and I'm safe with you. Oh, I'm gonna make it through. Rain came. Rain came, and wind blew, but my house was built on you. safe with you. Yes, I'm gonna make it through. Yeah, I'm gonna make it. Yeah, I'm gonna make it through. Cause I'm standing strong on you. Yeah, I'm gonna make it through. Cause my house is built on you. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations, so why would he fail now? He won't, he won't, he won't fail, he won't fail, he won't fail. He won't fail. fail. Lord God, we just place our trust in you as we step out into your world today. We know that you will not fail, that you will be with us. So guide us and strengthen us, Lord God. Send us to where we need to be sent this week. Speak to us and reveal to us your goodness and your grace. Amen. Please grab a seat, everyone. I just have a couple of notices. The first one is that if anything has struck a chord with you today, do, do, during today's service, please be aware that we do have prayer ministry that takes place just in the library here, and that is all completely confidential, so you can come and you can share, and someone would be very happy to pray for you. Also, I think the coffee route might be a little bit short this week, so if anyone is willing to help serve some teas and coffees this week just to help synth out, we would be very, very grateful. If you would like to do that, please just head over there, and yeah, um, that they would be very grateful, I am sure. The official notices are that we are having, uh, next Sunday actually, there's, a qu there's quite a bit on, so uh, please be here if you can. We have, first of all, the Bring and Share Lunch, lunch on the 29th of September. That's going to be after this service. So if you do want to come along, I think it's in celebration of Catherine because that is her final Sunday with us, as I've already said. So if you do want to come along and show your support, I'm sure she'll be very appreciative of that. Next slide, please, is we are going to be having uh, something a bit new that we haven't really tried before. Uh, in the Sir Thomas Brown, which is just over the estate on the other side of, of Yarm Road there, we are going to be doing a bit of pub outreach. So it's a wonderful opportunity to invite, if you know anyone who isn't a Christian but is maybe wrestling with faith a little bit, maybe they have some questions, on the 6, oh, sorry, uh, 6 p.m. on Mondays, starting from the 7th of October, me and Matt and a few other people are going to be doing a little bit of a pub outreach where you can come and have a discussion about faith and ask any questions that you want. And you'll see that it says, is it just a whole load of nonsense? You can come and ask anything, no holds barred. So if you know someone that just wants to come and ask questions, yes. If you're already Christian, can you go to us? So it, it, this is, uh, the, 
It's specifically for people who aren't Christians yet. I think that, that, is the, that is the idea of it. But thank you very much. That is a good question. Okay, next slide, please, is... Will be, oh, yes, we are going to be doing a bit of support for Ragworth Community Grocery this year. And that's going to be on the 13th. A super complicated secret thing. It is just an expression of our faith and of how God is already working within us. So if you do want to be baptized, there's still time. Come and have a chat with me. And please do come along to show your support for everybody who is getting baptized. Thank you all very much for listening to me. I know there was a lot there. But let's just say a quick prayer and then we can go off and enjoy the rest of our day. Heavenly Father, thank you for the love that you've shown us. Thank you for your care and your grace and your protection. I pray may you bless us all as we leave the service. Bless us as we go into our workplaces, as we go and enjoy the rest of this week that is starting, Lord. Be with us, we pray. Amen. Have everybody tea and coffee in the hall if you would like it. sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger